Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MS Neuro TV. Uh, we're going to give everyone a few minutes uh, as we get started and logged on tonight. We've got a lot of people very interested in tonight's topic of infusion therapies and very excited to have their questions answered by uh, Dr. Boster. And hi, everyone. Welcome back to MS Neuro TV, brought to you by MS Views and News and sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene. So first of all, we'd like to thank everyone who's joining us here again today because we have so many of you that have been following us every single month and we're glad that so many of you are finding these webinars helpful and if this is your first ms neuro tv webinar then welcome we really hope that you enjoy our monthly series of interviews with multiple sclerosis specialists and my name is anna fernandez de castro and i'm the assistant development coordinator over at ms views and news and as always, I'm here with Jennifer Falk, our Director of Development. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so MS Views and News is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to providing education and information to the multiple sclerosis community. So today we have Dr. Aaron Boster with us, and he'll be teaching us all about all the current MS infusion therapy options that are on the market right now. So he'll be giving us a quick overview of all these medications, including how they work, their safety, and their efficacy. Dr. Boster is a board certified neurologist, systems medical chief of neuroimmunology, and the director of the MS Center at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. He knew that he wanted to become an MS specialist since he was 12 years old, as he was raised in a family that was impacted by MS. This personal connection inspired him to dedicate his career to helping people who live with MS and their families. Okay, so we're about to play a 13 minute interview um, video with Dr. Boster. And after the video is over, Dr. Boster will be available for a live 15 minute Q&A with you. We just ask that you please keep your questions on topic and please complete the quick survey that's gonna pop up at the end of the webinar. So, for those of you that are calling in tonight and don't have video access, please know that you're going to hear about 13 minutes of silence while we play our pre-recorded video interview with Dr. Boster. But don't worry, please stay on the line because once the video is done playing, you'll be able to hear us again during the live Q&A. Okay, let's begin. to MS Neuro TV, presented by MS Views and News. MS Neuro TV is a comprehensive educational program bringing together MS professionals from across the United States covering the topics that you want to learn more about. To register for MS Neuro TV webinars, visit www.msviewsandnews.org. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the program. Dr. Boster, can you please provide us with a description of the infusion treatment options? Also, can you tell us about the efficacy and safety of each of these infusion therapies? In considering disease-modifying therapies, it's become a complex conversation. I remember when we had a handful of drugs, we could go over every single drug in the clinic room. It's becoming harder and harder to do that as we have over 20 different formulations of disease-modifying therapies available in, in the FDA here in the United States. Infusible medicines, IV medicines, are not a class of medicine. And I just want to be clear that, that that's not one type of medicine. That's a route of administration through the IV. 
Interestingly, as it turns out in the modern era, the most efficacious drugs we have happen to be infusible agents. And I think in part because of that, and in part because they're all similar in their mechanisms of monoclonal antibodies, we, we, we batch them together. So we're gonna talk about infusible agents, but I just wanna be clear that that's actually several different kinds of medicines. So the first one I'll talk about is the oldest, and the, the, the real name is natalizumab. I didn't make these names up. Um, natalizumab, the trade name is, is Tysabri. And Tysabri uh, came out in 2004. In 2017, it's still very relevant and it's still, in my opinion, one of the top three drugs used to treat MS. Tysabri is a very interesting molecule. It's given through the vein, it takes about an hour to run the infusion, and it's done every month, every 28 days. It can't be done sooner than that. It can be done a little farther if necessary. The way it works mechanistically is fascinating. It really tightens the blood-brain barrier so that cells, naughty autoreactive white blood cells in the bloodstream can't penetrate into the central compartment. If you think of the nascent MS brain, or the blood-brain barrier, as like the straw house and the three little pigs, and if you put interferon on it, it becomes the stick house, it's a little bit better barrier. When you put Tysabri on it, it becomes the brick house. Then you have to sing, she's a brick. Sorry, I won't do that. But, but this, this great wall of China, this brick wall, prevents these, these cells from entering the brain. It really, in essence, creates a compartmental immunosuppression. Not in the rest of the human body, just in the central compartment, brain and spinal cord. And as it stands to reason, if those naughty autoreactive cells can't get into the brain, they can't attack the brain. And so as a result, we see really impressive reductions in annualized relapse rate and disability progression in MRI using natalizumab, Tysabri. Tysabri has one major risk, and it's a small risk of an opportunistic infection. Opportunistic infection means it's not a very good infection. It can't get you sick normally. You have to be suppressed in some fashion in order for this thing to be able to do its job. There's a virus called the JC virus. About half of adults have it. And it doesn't hurt us. Our immune systems actually beat it up all day long. But with certain situations, such as Tysabri, which suppresses the central compartment, the JC virus can go unchecked. Because there are no cells inside the brain, white blood cells surveying the brain, if JC virus gets in there, it can wreak havoc and there's no cops to stop it. PML can be fatal. It's very, very serious. Fortunately, we can mitigate that risk through a clever test, a JC virus antibody test, which tells us whether or not an individual person has been exposed to the JC virus, and if they have, what their viral load is. That allows us to make very informed decisions about risk benefit. There may be someone who's JC virus positive, and their PML risk is one thousandth of a percent. There could be another person with MS on Tysabri whose PML risk is greater than one in a hundred. And so as you can imagine, the important piece is to have the conversation about risk and benefit, and to constantly revisit that conversation when using Tysabri. So the second infusible agent I'll talk about is alemtuzumab. Limtrata. Alemtuzumab is given through an IV, but it's very, very different. All of these infusible drugs are monoclonal antibodies. They're all smart bombs. They all have very, very specific targets. And the easiest way to think about a monoclonal is it's like a key. It only fits a certain door. A second ago, when I talked about Tysabri, that door tightened up the blood brain barrier. With Limtrata Alemtuzumab, the smart bomb does something different. When you infuse it into the human body, it floats around the bloodstream and identifies all the cells that express a sign called CD52. If your cell expresses that sign, this drug, alemtuzumab, lemtrada, binds to it and causes it to die. So it sort of reminds me of the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus, where the, the Hebrews put blood on the door frame and the angel of death passed them over. Well, this is opposite day. So you mark it and they come and kill you. And as a result, you wipe out your adult B and T cells. And those are the cells that are attacking you in the setting of MS. You don't affect the pluripotent stem cells. And that's very, very important. Because afterwards, after you knock out the adults, something really weird happens. The pluripotent stem cells, the baby cells, grow back differently. They grow back with larger regulatory components. And you actually reboot the immune response to misbehave less often after giving someone alemtuzumab lemtrada.
Now, unlike Tysabri, which is given once a month, Limtrata is given daily for five days in a row, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Then there's 12 months where we don't treat. And then we do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it's five days, you wait a year, three days. After we do that, we never treat the patient again unless they have a new clinical attack or two new spots on their MRI. Now, looking at the clinical trials data, we can go out now seven years. When you look out seven years, 55% of the patients never got retreated, meaning they got treated at time point zero in year one. Then they went six years and never got retreated because they didn't have anything happen. 30% of the patients required a third round, a third course of Lemtrada. They got five, three, and then somewhere along the line, they needed another three. And so 85% of patients in this cohort went seven years and only were treated twice or three times. Kind of exciting, really neat drug. It's also a very, very complex drug. And the safety monitoring for alemtuzumab is amongst the most arduous of all the drugs that we use. There's infusion reactions. In fact, 93% of people can have an infusion reaction when they receive the drug. And so we've learned mitigation strategies of giving people steroids and Tylenol and Benadryl and other tricks and stuff to make it tolerable. Once you've been dosed with the drug, there's a risk of having a shingles outbreak or a, a herpetic outbreak, which is extremely painful. And so we, we give people a cyclovir for a couple months to suppress that. The other uh, risk to consider is that of autoimmunity. When we knock out the B and T cells, we don't give them all back on the same day. We give them back slowly over time in chunks. The B cells come back at three to six months, then the CD8 cells come back around nine months, then later, 12 months, we see the CD4 cells come back. And because there's this imbalance, we can create a opportunity to cause autoimmunity. In fact, there's a 40% chance that we can cause thyroid disease when we give Lemtrada. The peak risk is three years after the first dose. There's a 2% risk that we could cause the platelets the, to not clot. So if you cut yourself and it forms a, a scab, those are platelets. And there's a 2% risk that might not work. And there's a 0.3% risk, a third of a percent, of autoimmune kidney disease. Now, in order to monitor for all of this, there's a program that all patients participate in. And it essentially involves having a laboratory once a month. We send a nurse ninja to your house for free, or to your work for free, and he or she draws blood and urine to check for kidney function, thyroid function, and all the white blood cells in the platelets. And this is the information that we use to help keep patients safe, Lemtrada. The third infusible agent uh, on the market is called Ocrevus, or Ocrelizumab. And it's another monoclonal antibody, just like Tysabri and Lemtrada. But Ocrevus is a different monoclonal antibody. It's a smart bomb or a key that only binds to cells that express the sign CD20. And the only cells that do that are adult B cells. Whereas Lemtrada knocked down B and T cells, Ocrevus knocks down just adult B cells. Not the pluripotent stem cells, and not the plasma cells that make antibodies, but the adult B cells. Now how does this help MS? It's really kind of fascinating, and it makes me think of boys in high school that bump into each other in the hallway and decide the best option is to duke it out at 3.30 behind B building. So when these two young men show up to fight, they show up with six of their best friends. No boy shows up to fight after school by himself. And if he arrived and none of his friends were around, he would leave, he wouldn't fight. In this analogy, the fighter is the T cell. He is unable to get riled up to go attack the brain and spinal cord and MS unless the B cells co-stimulate him. So with Ocrevus, we kill all the B cells, we remove all the friends. And so the T cell is left unable to become adequately stimulated to attack. And that slows down MS quite handsomely. Ocrelizumab was tested not just in relapsing MS. We use Tysabri and Lemtrada in relapsing MS, and we can use Ocrelizumab in relapsing MS effectively. But we also did a very special trial called the Oratorio trial, where we studied Ocrelizumab in primary progressive MS in patients that weren't having clinical attacks. And for the first time in the history of the universe, we successfully slowed down a form of multiple sclerosis that we were never able to touch before. We now can show a 24% reduction in disability, giving people with PPMS, Ocrelizumab, Ocrevus, compared to placebo. And, and please don't for a, a second think that's not a big deal. That's a very, very big deal. And 
I am so excited to be able to bring that to patients. Ocrelizumab has infusion reactions, but much less than you see with alemtuzumab lemtrada. With ocrelizumab, there's about a 30% chance of an infusion reaction, the first infusion. After that, it's actually less than 10% and pretty well tolerated. The infection risk with ocrelizumab is very similar to the interferon drugs like Rebif. And that's very reassuring because the infection risk overall, in my opinion, is quite low. In the clinical trials, there was an imbalance in breast cancer, and I have to explain that. Because when you say the words breast cancer, that's very, very scary, and, it, and as it should be. When we did the clinical trials, we randomly assigned men and women to either receive Ocrevus or something else, depending on the trial. None of these people got breast cancer in the other arm. In the Ocrevus arm, there were six women that got breast cancer. And in the follow-up, there were three more, so that's nine. So anyone would take pause and say, wait a second, Aaron, does it cause breast cancer? When we've explored it, it doesn't look like it does although it's not completely clear, let me explain. When you look epidemiologically at all the number of women in the trial and their age, and you calculate the risk of breast cancer, the answer was the same number, about nine. So we're not sure whether this was a happenstance, a statistical thing that occurred by chance, or whether there's a signal. The FDA said as much in their label, they said we're not sure there's a signal. And so we don't wanna be overreacting, and yet we don't wanna be cavalier. We recommend that women that receive Ocrevus do monthly breast exams, self-breast exams, and have mammograms when it's time. And it's our hope that that way they can stay safe. Ocrelizumab. So, Dr. Boster, can you tell us with all these new drugs that are out right now, these new medications, can you tell us what's in the pipeline? I mean, what's the next step? What's the next phase of medications? We've seen step-by-step -step tiers in the last few years, and so many people are now asking, what's next to come along? I think that over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna see several new monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I think that biologics are here to stay in MS. Um, one of the biologics that's currently being tested is another uh, anti-B cell agent. Uh, and it's a monoclonal antibody, but it's actually an injection. Um, and so it makes an interesting point that not everything highly efficacious needs to be an infusion. More to come over the next several years. Dr. Boster, thank you very much. Okay, great. Welcome back, everyone. And I hope that you can hear me okay. We've got a lot of people that are still on the line with us. And so now is your time. This is the question and answers uh, segment of tonight's webinar. So it's your time to get into that little box that you're going to see, hopefully on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, it says questions and start typing your questions in for Dr. Boster, who we do have on the line with us tonight. Uh, if you don't see the box, look for a little orange arrow and click on it. It should make the box available to you. And I'm going to answer your questions as they come in. Um, no one ca else can see them. I will be reading them out to the audience. Um, so I'm gonna answer them uh, as they come in in the order that they are received. So, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Boster. Dr. Boster, are you with us? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me. Howdy. Absolutely. Howdy to you. And thanks for being with us tonight. Um, we have some great questions coming in. And I will start with uh, our first question, which is I've heard a lot and I'd love to hear your answer. Is it safe to get a shingles shingrix vaccine while you are on ocrevus so uh that's a great question and uh the the question really has to do with a couple things so let's kind of break it down ocrevus or ocrelizumab is one of the 17 different formulations in us medicines it's an infusible monoclonal antibody which means it's kind of like a biologic smart bomb that targets and destroys b cells Okay. And so this Ocrevus helps us in the setting of MS because B cells are needed for the pathology of MS. You need B cells to rile up the T cells, and, and the T cells are the ones that attack you. So if you knock out the B cells, then they're not available, and they can't get the T cells riled up, and then the uh, MS consequently slows down. So the, the shingles vaccine, if we just talk about vaccines in general, 
you know, vaccines are a way of sensitizing your immune system against bad guys. So when we talk about the the her, herpetic family of, of infections like varicella, like the the uh, thing that gives us chicken pox, this is the varicella virus. And there's a couple different vaccines out there. Uh, and what a vaccine is, is it takes the virus and it, it kills it or, or attenuates it, meaning it kind of turns it off. And then they smash it up into little pieces and they literally inject it into the human being. That's the vaccine. And then the human being's immune system identifies the parts, the shredded up parts of that virus, and it builds an arsenal against it. Mostly it builds antibodies against it. So once you make an antibody response, your body keeps that for a long time, sometimes for your whole life, which means down the road, if you came in contact with the, the chickenpox virus, the, your immune system is already ready to fight it. It already has an arsenal against it because it was immunized or vaccinated. So in the setting of receiving Ocrevus, there's two things that we have to consider. The first one is that we don't want to give human beings live attenuated virus uh, if they have multiple sclerosis. And this is a theoretical concern, but it's one that I adhere to. And the concern is, if, if we give you a, a live virus that's been turned off, it's not dead. It's still a, a real virus, and it could cause a small infection. It's possible that it could mount a small infection. And as we're aware, when someone with multiple sclerosis gets infected, it can trigger an attack. So theoretically, a live attenuated vi uh, vaccine could trigger an MS attack. Now, the reality is this doesn't happen almost ever, um, and if not with the vaccines that are typically given, like the Pneumovax and shingles vaccine and the like. But still, we shy away from live attenuated vaccines. Using a dead vaccine doesn't create this problem because the dead vaccine isn't alive and it can't mount any type of immune response. And therefore, it can't, um, it can't trigger an attack. That's the first thing we have to think about. But the second thing we have to think about has to deal with the drug Ocrevus. Ocrevus kills B cells, and that could interfere with our immune system's ability to mount a response to the vaccine. In other words, I'm taking Ocrevus, and I've knocked down a lot of my B cells, and then I get the vaccine for whatever, and the machinery needed to mount the response, I just beat up. And so there's a concern that if you took a, a vaccine, dead vaccine, at the wrong time while on Ocrevus, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't, it's not going to hurt the patient. It's just not going to be effective. So to specifically answer the question, if the vaccine in question is live attenuated, my answer is no thank you. The second part is, the timing that you give with Ocrevus. And what we recommend for any vaccine or any immunization is that it's administered six weeks prior to the next Ocrevus infusion. Why? Because that's when the Ocrevus is going to arguably be the least uh, impactful on the immune response. And so it gives your body the best chance to build an immune response to that virus prior to receiving your next dose. And so if you're dealing with a dead virus, not live attenuated, and if it's given six weeks prior to the uh, Ocrevus infusion, it should be okay. And that was a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Awesome. That was a fantastic answer, and I'm so glad that uh, she asked that question. Thank you. Um, we have our next question. Someone is writing, howdy. Coincidentally, I will be getting my first Ocrevus infusion tomorrow. Can you talk about how patients tend to feel the day following? Is there fatigue? Will I feel tired? Will I need to take rest from work? Thank you. Excellent, excellent question. So first of all, howdy back to you. Um, second of all, congratulations on embarking on a highly effective medicine like Ocrevus. That's really exciting. And you almost feel bad for the MS because you're about to mess MS up pretty badly. That's exciting, right? Yeah. Now, w and we have, I was an investigator in the clinical trials. And so I ran about 30 humans through the clinical trials. 
And at our center, we have 700 people that we've treated with Ocrevus. So I, I have some experience in, in helping people shepherd through these infusions, and, and that's the experience that I'm about to speak from. So the, the first infusion, there's just shy of a 30% chance, so one in three, that you're going to have some kind of infusion reaction. This is what we saw in the trials, and this is what's been true with my patients that we've treated at our center. So two-thirds of the people going through it, they don't experience anything. It's just boring. They just sit in a chair for several hours, and they play on their iPads, or they watch some television or read a book. One-third of people that receive the infusion experience infusion reactions. Now, infusion reactions range from mild, like I have a red rash, itchy, stuff like that, moderate, uh, maybe some chest pressure or some shortness of breath, and they can go to severe and life-threatening. And we have had zero life-threatening infusions, zero life-threatening infusions. And the vast majority of the infusion reactions have been mild to moderate. Now, fortunately, we don't leave matters up to chance. We actually give people before the Ocrevus some pre-medication. So pre-medication is, is drugs we give you to make the Ocrevus more tolerable. And this includes giving a little bit of steroids, like 125 milligrams of prednisone, IV, some Benadryl, and some, maybe some Tylenol. And these pre-medications make you tolerate the okra much, much better. Now, the vast majority of people have no problems. Some, about a third of people have mild to moderate infusion reactions. And infusion reactions last up to, but not longer than a day, than 24 hours. So however it is you're feeling, good, bad, or ugly, it's going to be that way no longer than a day. Um, if I was worried, I might take the second day off or tell my boss, look, I don't know how I'm going to feel. I have to let you know. But I would certainly not budget for more time off than that at the most. And I'll share with you anecdotally, the vast majority of our patients tolerate Ocrevus swimmingly well, and they really don't struggle with it too much. And I think that's because we're good at infusing and because our nurses are excellent at giving pre-medications. I also want to share that after the first infusion, the risk of a subsequent infusion reaction goes way down. So with the first infusion, it's just less than 30%. With the second, third, fourth, et cetera, it's less than 10%. So uh, from a guy that does a lot of infusion medicine, I personally view this one as not so bad. So I wish you the very, very best of luck, and I'm excited for you as you enter starting this brand new therapy. Good job. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, someone is asking, how would a doctor decide to give a patient with uh, relapsing, remitting MS ocrevus? How would they come to that decision? So Decision. So, so the first thing is no doctor decides to put a patient on a drug. At least no doctor should decide to put a patient on a drug. A doctor should work with a patient and their family as a team to together decide the best drug. So I'm a firm believer that we make group decisions because the person who has the most at stake, the person most invested the leader of the village is the person with the condition, right? So that's the person impacted by MS. And the doctor is a key village member, a key helper in trying to make them the most awesome version of them possible despite having to have MS. So my first comment is it's not the doctor's decision, it's a group decision. Now, within that context of the group decision, how do you pick one drug over another? Well, First of all, there's no easy recipe where you type into a Google search engine and answer four questions and it spits out the drug. It, unfortunately, things aren't that straightforward when the immune system and the nervous system interface. So we have to consider several lines of evidence to conclude what's the best medicine for that person at that time. These include the severity of their disease process. Some people have very aggressive disease and some people fortunately don't. And the people who have aggressive disease, we may tend to use more effective medicines earlier on. Some people have certain risk factors which predispose them to have more aggressive disease than others. And this would subsequently drive us to push towards the more effective therapies. 
we also have to consider the human beings' desires and their wants and their needs. So some people say, look, Foster, don't give me a pill. I, I forget pills daily. I never remember to take my pills. If you give me a pill, I'm going to forget to take it. Other people said, whatever you do, never say the word shot. I pass out when I see needles. And if I have to give myself an injection, I would rather explode, right? And then some people say, you know, I think that only having to come in to, to be infused twice a year sounds like something I could get, a, get in, in touch with, right? In other words, the route of administration and the frequency of administration factor into this decision. We also have to consider the side effect profile. So I'll use a different example. Um, so if, if you had, oh, what's a good example? A history of a recent heart attack, God forbid, right? So you had a heart attack in the last month or two, and you're picking an MS medicine, you wouldn't pick Jelenia. Because the first couple months after a heart attack, Jelenia is not a good medicine for you. Now, if you go a couple months past that, it's okay. But my point is, this particular risk factor, this particular side effect profile might lead us to not want to do a given drug over another. So when you put all that together, you're sitting down with a human being and with that person's family and their care partners, and you're talking through the aggressiveness of their disease state, their demographic details, their early clinical details. You're also looking at the severity of their disease on examination, and very importantly, looking at the severity of disease on their MRI. You're then having a conversation with them about their wants, desires, their likes, their dislikes, and how they want to be infused or injected or have a pill to swallow. And, and then through this conversation, you start to rule out drugs. You start to cross things off your list. Well, I'm worried about aggressive disease, so I'm not going to use low efficacy. This person is needle phobic, so I'm not going to use shots. They can't take a pill twice a day, so I'm not going to use a twice a day pill. And you start to narrow, narrow, narrow down to when you get to a couple drugs. Now, the way that I do this might be a bit different than the next guy. What I like to do is I like to, in my head through this process, get it down to say the top four drugs or top three drugs I want the person to think about. Then what I do is I write the drugs on the whiteboard in my clinic room in order of my preference which is always based on efficacy for me. And I talk about the first one, and I talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if they think that sounds grand, that's what we go with. And if they say, no, nah, I'm not so sure, then I downgrade my option to the next best option on my list, and I talk to them about that. And if they say, well, that's the one for me, when we go with that one. And we keep going down until we run out of options, and then we have to start over. <laughs> so, so, Obviously, there's no easy, quick way, but you can imagine that a drug that is highly effective, that works on brain volume, works on MRI spots, works on progression, works on attacks, it's only given twice a year, it's a favorable side effect profile, might be a drug that many people might get excited about. And that's certainly been our experience in this first year and change after the launch of Ocrevus. Excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for helping us understand what an individualized choice uh, this is and, and how to go through that process. Um, right on. Yeah. I, we have a question. Is the JC virus and PML a concern in what, while taking Ocrevus? Excellent question. So PML is a infection caused by a virus called the JC virus. And it's extremely rare, super rare, that people get the PML infection. Now, there are certain conditions which, which increase the risk. And one of the most commonly discussed ones is taking the medicine natalizumab, codenamed Tysabri. And so many of us that have been in the MS space are familiar with the fact that if you have been exposed to the virus, half of humans have expo been exposed to JC virus. And if you take Tysabri, there's an increased risk of getting the PML infection. And so it stands to reason if there's a new MS medicine, we might ask the same question. What's the risk with this new medicine? Now, Ocrevus is not Tysabri, and Tysabri is not Ocrevus. And as we talk about Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab, we keep in mind a couple of things. Number one, there have been cases of PML in a different 
anti-CD20 and a different compound that kills B cells, and that's called rituxan. And there have been MS patients that have gotten PML on other drugs, but there has not been Ocrevus treated patients that got PML, with the exception of four times. There are patients who had been on Tysabri first. They had been on Tysabri for a while. They switched. Now they're on Ocrevus and they're diagnosed with PML. And in all four cases, when we've gone backwards and we've looked at their MRIs prior to switching, golly gee, they had PML on their prior MRIs. And we call those carryover cases. So to date, we have not had any PML with Ocrevus in MS-treated patients except for carryover. Now, that does not mean that it's not possible. It is possible, just like lots of other things are possible. But I am reassured that to date we have not seen that. Now, the question didn't just ask about PML. It asked about the JC virus antibody test. The JC virus antibody test was developed by the folks that make Tysabri, and it was studied exclusively amongst Tysabri-treated patients. So whenever anyone uses the JC virus testing outside of the Tysabri treated patient, we have to be very, very, very cautious because it's not really a test that was studied that way. I do not think it's necessary to follow JC virus titers when you treat someone with Ocrevus, and I do not do that. What I do do, which I think is very important, is whenever I switch from one drug to another, and it doesn't have to just be Tysabri, but when I switch from drug A to drug B, in this case, we'll use the example of Tysabri to Ocrevus, I think we need to get at least an MRI in between the two treatments. Why? So that we can look at the MRI to make sure it doesn't look like PML. Because if we saw PML, boy, we would do a bunch of different things as opposed to starting the next drug. Now, there are some people, mostly in Europe, who when they transition off of Tysabri or onto another highly effective agent, they do two things. They get a, an MRI and a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, so they can look at whether or not there's virus in the spinal fluid, and that's the definitive test. I personally do not think this is necessary as long as I have a good quality MRI and that my MRI is reassuring. So the short answer is no cases of, of PML to date with Ocrevus except for carryover. And I do not think it's helpful to check a JC virus titer in an Ocrevus treated patient. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. And we have a lot of questions, but we are kind of running out of time. I'm going to shoot you off one more question. Um, I have started Ocrevus. My first infusion was March. Second infusion was in September. How will I know if Ocrevus is working for me? How long does it take to notice any effects, if there are any? Well, so let's talk about a, a different drug called oral birth control. Okay, So if a young lady who is sexually active starts oral birth control, and she's sexually active and, and doesn't get knocked up, it worked. The absence of a baby is proof of the success of the treatment. Right? So right. it's not that we're looking, it's not like she becomes smarter or taller when she takes birth control. She just doesn't get pregnant when she takes birth control. Now, all of these disease modifying therapies, all of them, their primary goal is to prevent attacks, disability, and new spots on the MRI. So, in one line of reasoning, the absence of events meaning the absence of new clinical attacks, the absence of worsening on exam, the absence of new spots on MRI is evidence that the, that particular therapy is working. Now, if you could clone a human, so now there's two humans, uh, clone A and clone B, and we give clone A the drug and clone B a hug, and then we get back together in five years, we could definitively answer whether or not the drug worked. Because if clone A is doing great, and clone B, unfortunately, is not, well, that's proof. And that's silly talk because we don't know how to clone people. And even if we could, I doubt your spouse would let you clone yourself. And so instead, we leverage our knowledge from clinical trials. A clinical trial takes almost a, you know, several hundred, if not a thousand people with MS and randomly assigns them to two groups and gives one group one drug and one group another drug and sees how they do. And from that clinical trial, we can learn that, hey, 
this particular drug is really effective. It seems to work really well. And then we extrapolate that information to apply it to our patient in clinic. So, so that's really what I do when I'm trying to monitor a drug, is I'm looking for the absence of bad things, the absence of new spots, the absence of new attacks, the absence of worsening on, um, on examination to identify if it's working. So if you're tolerating your drug, you're not having attacks, you're not having new MRI spots, and your exam's the same, I would submit to you that it seems to be working pretty well. Okay, great. Well, thank you. And if you want to keep going for a moment or two, Jennifer, I can answer yeah. a few more. Okay. All right. I, I feel bad because there are so many great questions, and, and I, I, I want everyone to to get them answered. So I, we really appreciate that. So I, we have someone else here. Um, give me just a second. Um, Say it again. They're, they're asking, um, in being on Tysabri, uh, they, they are testing positive for the JC virus. Uh, they believe that they are at a level two, a number two at the, of the JC virus. Would you recommend to try or not to try uh, Tysabri? So, so this is a great question. Let me start off by saying Tysabri is a heck of a drug. It's a really, really effective, highly effective disease modifying therapy. So from an efficacy standpoint, it's on the top shelf, right? It's, it's really, in my opinion, the three most effective drugs out there are Lintrata, Ocrevus, and, and Tysabri, all right, those three drugs. So, so you're talking about a highly effective therapy. And whenever you talk about the effectiveness of a drug, you also have to consider the risks of the drug. So the biggest risk with Tysabri is this PML that we've been talking about. Right. And we can stratify the risk of PML by understanding a couple factors. Number one, has the person ever received chemo? If they have, they're four times more likely to develop PML on Tysabri than if they have not. So if the person has gotten prior chemo, this may not be the number one choice. The second thing is how long have they been on Tysabri? Because every year you're on Tysabri can increase the risk in the setting of being JC virus positive. Right? Now, if you're JC virus negative, that's not true, because if you're negative, you haven't been exposed to the infection. And so I should have started by saying another factor is whether or not you've been exposed to the JC virus. So have you been exposed to the virus, yes or no? How long have you been on drug, the number of years? And have you had prior chemo? So here we have a situation where the person's never been on drug, and I'm going to make the assumption they have not been on chemo, okay, just for the sake of this question. Now we have to look at, are they, have they been exposed to the virus? The answer is yes. And what they were saying to us with this number two, I'm inferring, is they're making reference to the, the titer. The, you know, there's a level, and it's really, it's called an optic density, but let's just think of it as like a titer. So I really draw a line in the sand at 1.5. I call everything less than 1.5 low, low and I call everything above 1.5 high. So this would be a high titer. So here we have someone who's considering a highly effective therapy, Tysabri, but they have a high titer to the JC virus. And for me, Aaron, that's not a no. For many, many MS neurologists in the United States in 2018, it is a no. They say, hey, look, I don't want to put you at any risk. I'm a little bit different in my thinking because I don't think it's my right or privilege to tell you no. It's not my body. But what I have to tell you is there's a small risk of PML. And that small risk of PML in the first year is about one hundredth of a percent. So that means you take a dollar and you turn it into 100 pennies. And you take a penny and you cut it into 100 pieces. And so it's a hundredth of a percent. It's a very, very small statistical risk. And, if, and I think I need to explain that to the human being because they may say, well, golly gee, Aaron, I'm not worried about that risk. Or they may say I'm uncomfortable. And based on that response, we would proceed. Mm -hmm. I also have to say that the risk of PML in this patient will go up. So in year two, it goes up. In year three, it goes up. In year four, it goes up. And in my experience, at some point, very likely that person's going to become uncomfortable. At some point, they may say, I don't feel comfortable any longer, in which case you're going to have to change. So I can't give you a yes, no answer. What I can give you is some education 
with regards to the risk profile. And then I can be a good listener as you say, whoa, man, I'm scared of that. Or no, that doesn't bother me. And what I do with my patients in clinic, and I have several patients who are on Tysabri, who are JC virus positive, and I see them every three months. And every three months, we check a JC virus titer. And every three months, we have the same conversation. This is your risk profile. How comfortable are you? Yes or no. And then based on that comfort level, we decide whether or not we want to continue. So hopefully that helps shed some light on whether or not we would do that. Yeah, that sheds a lot of light. And that actually answered a lot of other people's questions in regards to um, their fears uh, with the JC virus. And thank you. Thank you for giving us all no of this. No problem. You know, We're really absolutely. grateful. You know, the one, uh, the one last thing I'm, I'll, I'll say, Jennifer, is that I think all too often, Human beings zoom in, laser focused on the risks of a given therapy, right? And sometimes I, I'm fearful that the human being is forgetting to place the risk of the therapy inside the context of the risk of the disease. Because oftentimes we're not choosing Tysabri, Limtrada, Ocrevus because they're doing awesome. We're not choosing these drugs because they have the quietest MS in clinic. On the contrary, a lot of times we're choosing these drugs because they have active disease. They have legit, active, not so nice MS. And so we have to consider the risk of under treating them, you know, putting them on a low efficacy medicine that doesn't work that well and allowing them to accrue brain damage and allowing them to accrue accelerated brain shrinkage and allowing them to get new spots and allowing them to have attacks and lose function that they don't regain. Right. And I think all too often we get so focused on one hundredth of a percent risk of PML that we forget there is a one hundred percent chance, a hundred percent chance that they have active disease right now, MS. And and I just I want us to be mindful of that so that we remember that we have to think about the reason that we're subjecting the person to this risk, or at least asking them to subject themselves to the risk. It's not because we like risk, it's because we really, really don't like MS. And I am much more fearful of 100% active MS than I am of a hundredth of a percent risk of a particular infection. Yeah, that's a, that's a very clear way of looking at something that can be very confusing. Thank you, we really appreciate that explanation. That's awesome. My pleasure. Well, should we do one more before we wrap up tonight? What do you think? Sure. You want to do awesome. one more? Let's do it. Okay, let's see. Hold on a second. What is it? Um, well, this is good. How would you know if you have, if you're on Tysabri and you're feeling sick that you don't have the infection? How would you feel? And can you take antibiotics while you are on Tysabri? So let's answer the question in reverse. Yes, you can take antibiotics on Tysabri. There's no problem whatsoever. Okay. And keep in mind that Tysabri's effect is on the blood-brain barrier. It's on the entrance into the brain and spinal cord. The rest of your body is, is completely irrelevant to Tysabri. It can't, Tysabri can't affect the rest of your body. So your liver, your bones, your your skin, your bloodstream, all those things are unaffected by Tysabri. All Tysabri does is it makes a better blood-brain barrier to keep viruses and nasties and in particular overly active MS cell from crossing. So, so that's the first thing is antibiotics are fine and they're gonna work normal because they don't really have an impact um, where Tysabri has an impact. That's the first thing. The second thing is when you talk about the, the infection, I assume you're talking about a PML infection. So I'm gonna answer the question as if that's what you had asked, that what would it feel like to have the PML infection? Well, the, the, the PML infection is not like a cold where you get sniffles or feel nauseated or have a fever or throw up. The, the three most classic presentations for PML are as follows. Number one is sudden bilateral blindness. I'm not talking about optic neuritis. I'm talking about I suddenly cannot see out of either of my eyeballs, right? And that is one of the three most common presentations of PML. It is not 
one eye gets painful with movement and the vision gets weird and over a couple days I lose vision. That's optic neuritis. This is different. All right, so that's the first presentation. The second presentation is suddenly I can't move one side of my body like a stroke. So MS doesn't really do that where suddenly you can't move one entire side of your body. With MS, you might have a leg that gets weak over a couple days or an arm that gets weak over a couple days, but you don't suddenly have both arm and leg stop working like a stroke. And the third presentation of, of PML is the person is completely off the rocker goofy. Now, I don't mean that I'm a funny, crazy person and I'm acting goofy. I'm talking about stripping your clothes off, running down the street, singing songs. You know, where your family's calling me going, hey, Dr. Boster, I can't get her out of a tree. Right. You know, very, very unusual behaviors. Very clearly, it's not that hard to differentiate the common presentations of PML from MS or from a cold or from an infection. These are very, very specific, and they grab your attention something fierce. Now, to treat PML, we, we can't use antibiotics. They don't work because PML is not a bacteria. PML is a virus, and we don't have an antiviral for PML that doesn't exist. So when someone has PML in the setting of Tysabri, what's happened is Tysabri created the Great Wall of China so that your, your immune cells could not enter the brain. Because if they get in the brain, they're going to attack it. So we create the Great Wall of China with Tysabri to keep the immune cells out. But viruses like PML are super small. And they can sneak through the Great Wall of China, and they find themselves on the other side of the Great Wall, inside the brain, the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, and there's no immune cells to attack it. So it's kind of like if a really small burglar snuck into a museum after hours, and there's no guards in the museum. That little burglar could do anything she wanted all night long because there's no one there to stop her. And what happens in the setting of PML is it causes demyelinating infection. So what we try to do when someone, God forbid, has PML in the setting of Tysabri is we remove the Tysabri to allow the immune cells to reconstitute in the brain. And the way that we remove the Tysabri is through a special procedure called total plasma exchange or plasmapheresis, where we hook them up to a machine and we, we run their blood through a machine and then put it back in them, but the machine cleans the antibodies off. And we do this in conjunction with steroids. And the goal here is to slowly allow the immune system, the immune cells, white blood cells, to re-enter the brain and fight the PML infection. Now, when you look at the statistics, about 20% of people who have PML die. And about 20% go back to work. And the remainder of people have some degree of neurological damage of varying different degrees. And the sooner we catch the PML, particularly if we catch it on the MRI before they have symptoms, the much, they do much, much better. So it all comes back to surveillance, serial MRIs, taking good histories, examining patients, following JC virus titers, so that we can identify an infection as early as humanly possible. That was a fantastic question. Thank you. Great. That was a fantastic answer. And I think just giving us all of this information and, and knowledge helps in reducing anxiety, helps in reducing fears, and helps people make really clear and informed choices. So we really thank you, Dr. Boston, for giving us all of this valuable information tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having yeah, me. Absolutely. And um, I think, Anna, Christina... Uh, still has some final closing words uh, for us this evening. Anna, are you still there? Yeah, yeah great. Really thank am. you, Jennifer. Okay, great. <laughs> Dr. Boston. And thank you so much, Dr. Boston. And thanks a lot for um, for giving us some extra time. Um, I really feel like you addressed so many people's concerns tonight, and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much. My pleasure, guys. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. And um, we'd also like to thank everyone here who has joined us tonight on MS Neuro TV. Um, and again, we'd really appreciate if you could please complete the brief survey that's going to pop up after the webinar is finished. Um, your feedback is important to us so that we can keep continuing to customize our events around our viewers. 
So our next webinar will be held on Tuesday, August 7th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, Dr. Megan Weigel will be joining us again and talking to us about MS relapses. She'll be covering topics such as how to recognize relapses, effective management, treatment options, and relapse recovery. And so if you're watching today's webinar live, then great. As you might know, you're already registered for the entire series, so just keep a lookout for our reminder emails um, for joining the, the next webinar. If you're not registered for this series yet and you're joining us on YouTube, you can find the registration link on our website, our Facebook page, or in this video's YouTube description. This video will soon be uploaded to our MS Fusion News YouTube learning channel, so make sure you subscribe to our channel to keep getting alerts on all our uh, latest uploads, including the videos of our live events. You can also follow us um, through Facebook, Instagram, and through Twitter. If you're enjoying these webinars so far, uh, please visit our website and check out our free live educational events all over the United States. New locations are constantly being added, so keep a lookout. For more information on any of our on any of our events and what's new in the world of multiple sclerosis, please visit us at www.msvn.org. And last but not least, we'd also like to give a, bit, a big thank you to Santa Fe Genzyme, Biogen, and Celgene for their ongoing support in making these programs possible and for their contributions to the entire multiple sclerosis community. And again, thank you everyone um, for joining us here today, and we'll see you all again next month. Thank you.